Okay, so so we have saved the best, and I won't say the most complicated for last here, but but maybe the the least, I'll say maybe experienced, you know, going through. So hopefully a lot of what we've talked about this morning and even early afternoon, most of you have had some exposure to, to these kinds of things, right, and, and being able to go forward. So I'll just say a, a, a bit unlike the PFMA process in, in what it provided. So again, I think I mentioned this morning, you know, you might have had, keep using the, the, the number 65, I don't know where it keeps coming from, maybe it was a project. Uh, you know, 65 category two failure modes, you know, trying to figure out what the heck to do with all of these. So that, you know, the PFMA reports and, you know, from our standpoint, we didn't require, hey, we wanna see uh, a recommendation or something from every one of these and a plan and schedule and, and things like that. I'll just say at times, it seemed like the PFMA reports, we got a lot, I think, out of the process and, and some out of the documentation, but it, for the most part, at least, I'll just, again, I'll just use my experience, you kind of, they could have been a doorstop at that point or a three ring binder on a shelf and maybe others had different experiences. Maybe you used them a lot more than, than I could see, you know, just as a regulator and, and helping you with the dam safety program. I, I really think this next part will, will be able to help take that information that we get, the evaluation of the L2RA results, and actually be able to integrate this and actually use this as a tool in helping you to be able to, to make a case, not only to your regulator, to FERC, on that as far as, hey, this is why I'm, I'm doing these things, I'm doing these things in this order, and this kind of urgency, as well as to your own internal staff and maybe senior management as far as resources and funding and things along those lines. So this really is intended to be a tool. It, it's not, sorry, I, I was a consultant for a long time, you know, and I did a lot of FERC things. It's, it's not the flavor of the month, okay? So th this is you know, really something that, again, FERC looked at this and said, you know, seeing how Reclamation has used it, seeing how the core has used it to actually help and enhance their dam safety programs, we see that as a tool, okay? So I wanted to just talk about, so, You've gone through all this, you've done the risk analyses, you've, you've done the documentation. So is that all? Is that all I've got to do and just I can walk away? So what, what's this going to look like? So we'll talk about it again from the FERC perspective, from the core perspective, and how this, this information gets used and evaluated. So let's talk again more generalities and we'll get more specific here as we go forward. So from a high level, independent consultant team responsibilities, we've talked is the L2RA report and the comprehensive assessment report. From the owner, from the licensee's perspective is that 60 days after that report is submitted to us, you're required to submit to us a plan and schedule that provides an outline of how you're gonna approach all the recommendations that the independent consultant team has included in the comprehensive assessment report. So that's pretty much your responsibility as, as the owner, right? So looking now at first at just the ICs, the IC team's responsibilities for the comprehensive assessment report. There are two sections in the comprehensive assessment report that require some kind of input on the L2RA PFMA information that, that you have to provide some information. Two places, that's it. One is in section seven of the comprehensive assessment report and the outline again, all this I'm just pulling out of chapter 16, but I just want to highlight this stuff for you and hopefully it makes more sense. So section seven is the review and evaluation of the PFMA and L2RA report. So two different scenarios here in this. The more common one is the first sub bullet there. So if the PFMA and L2RA report are prepared or is prepared by the IC team, then all you have to do is include that report as an appendix to the comprehensive assessment report. And all you've got to do is say, hey, the independent consult team was responsible for preparing this report and it's in the appendix, period. We're not asking the independent consultant team to provide an evaluation of the report that they've already written. I, I, I think we would hope we would know what kind of evaluation would come from that already, right? It's the best report you've ever seen, right? Okay, we, we don't need you to do that. We, we, know you're, we know you're great, it's okay. 
So that, but that's that's the most common scenario, probably 90, 95% of the time, right? The, the less common scenario is if the PFMA L2RA, L2RA report is not prepared by the IC team, it's prepared by a third party, a different consultant on that, then it is a responsibility for the IC team, even though they were present and going through the whole L2RA process and provided estimates, maybe they hadn't had a chance to review the report. So we want to make sure that there's an opportunity for the IC team to review that report and be able to say, hey, here are my comments. I either concur with everything in there or I take exception to these different things. That's all that needs to be included in section seven here for those two different scenarios, okay? The other section in the comprehensive assessment report is in section one, that's the findings and recommendations. So there are three subsections there that, that deal with what we've talked about today. So it's section uh, 1.5.1, 1, 1 the PFMA summary, section 1.5.2, the L2RA summary, and then finally section 1.5.3, with something we haven't even talked about yet, dam safety risk classification or DSERC. And we'll talk about more about that in just a minute. But those are the three sections that require some information from the IC team in the comprehensive assessment report to be able to summarize that information. Again, chapter 16 has a bit more information on what to include in each one of those sections. So you've done an, a, you're, you've done a comprehensive assessment, you know, uh, inspection, PFMA, L2RA, you're writing up the report, you've used this spreadsheet to come up with your results and it might look something like this okay so before I, we start talking through this i just want to make mention again because you're going to hear this hopefully multiple times here before you leave and so it, it's going to resonate you're going to think about it tonight you know in the in in your dreams okay that, that's my hope anyway that you know it's it's not all about where the number right it's not about where it plots it's a case that you've made for why the risks are what they are, what was driving the risk, the uncertainty, the confidence in the estimates on that. So given all of that first, okay, before we dive into, okay, what, what do these graphical representations look like? But these just could be four examples for, for example, that you might have from, from the results of your L2RA um, process, okay? A couple of different things in looking at. One of the first things that you should be looking at on some of these is, where does the total risk plot in, re in relationship to FERC's risk measures or risk guidelines? So this, this is the incremental life safety risk guideline here, this diagonal line we've been talking about. And this is the annual probability of failure guideline that Nate talked about earlier on each one of these plots. So you, you use the total risk to compare to these guidelines. Okay, so in this example, the total risk plots below both guidelines. That ought to be the first thing that you recognize from any one of these plots. The other thing to keep in mind is there's a reason why that box is red. It should, it should draw your attention to that one first, okay? Second one, we've got a guy, you know, the total risk is, is just above the annual probability of failure and just below the incremental life safety. Third one, it's above both guidelines. Fourth one, it's above the incremental life safety guideline and right on the annual probability of failure guideline. Okay, so you can have all sorts of different scenarios, again, depending on your project. All of these totals are, are from all the different in individual failure modes that, that the team looked at to be able to get to that point. All of these contribute so something, some more than others, some much more than others, to that total risk value here and being able to move forward, okay? That's important to see. In fact, there might be a question on that later, okay? So the question becomes, you know, back up here, which, you know, which recommendations, how do we do all of our evaluation when we have something like that? So we wanna be able to identify those failure modes that are contributing most to the risk. So Nate talked about Earlier, like, so up here in the upper right-hand corner is your highest risk values. And in the lower left-hand corner are your lowest risk values. So all of these diagonal lines that you see in this chart are lines of equal risk, okay? So as you're coming through this, everything is on the diagonal 
when we're talking about risk space. When we're talking about annual probability of failure space, it's the vertical here. It's the y-axis in going through and looking at these guidelines. So if you were to come over to the far right one over here and say, so what failure mode or failure modes are contributing most to the total risk here, you would go to that dot right there that represents one or perhaps more failure modes. And that's contributing most to the, to the total project risk. And then you can continue to come down these lines until you intersect the next one and say, okay, well, well, that one would be the next one that's contributing to my risk. So that'd be a second rank, and then a third rank right next to it. And then I have these two on the same line. They have the exact same risk value, but just different uh, annual probability of failure and different consequence values associated with that. So that's how you would kind of look at that particular way of trying to kind of rank and understand which ones are contributing most to the risk and adding all of that up. Now, now by the time you start getting down into these lower areas, you know, we, we call it pencil dust. I mean, this is all a log log scale, right? So by the time you're getting two or three, four orders of magnitude below, these ones down here aren't contributing hardly anything to your total at that point. So which ones do we wanna say, hey, let's make sure we at least capture these ones in moving forward. So we've provided some guidance on that. So let's talk first in, in risk space. So for the incremental life safety risk, provide an evaluation of the potential failure modes that plot above and within two orders of magnitude below the tolerable risk reference line. Okay, what, so what does that mean? So let's come over here to this first one as an example. So here's the tolerable risk reference line. We have no failure modes plotting above it. We have no failure modes plotting within an order of magnitude, but we do have one, two, three failure modes plotting within two orders of magnitude of that line. The failure modes that represent these three dots should have a risk evaluation and recommendations associated with those in the report. These other ones down here, if there's something significant to be able to identify from a possible risk reduction measure for some monitoring enhancement, inspections, yes, include those. You know, at, I'll just say at the discretion of the independent consultant team, but, but we would not necessarily be looking for anything specific for failure modes there, okay? Let's do a contrary. So, so that was a good day for you, okay? We'll go over here and look at this one. So same thing. So here's our tolerable risk reference line. We have one failure mode plotted above and one right on, and then two orders of magnitude. So again, looking at the diagonals, one, two, so everything above that line. So that means every one of those failure modes that are represented here should have something in the comprehensive assessment report that provides some evaluation of that. Are there risk reduction measures that should be considered for this? What, what would be kind of their rank and priority? Now, that might seem kind of overwhelming on some projects when you say, my gosh, Doug, I mean, you talk about a lot of these. But keep in mind, we're, we're just ranking them. We're not giving urgency associated with this. Some of these, depending on, you know, what else the, the licensee might have in your inventory, and, I, and this may sound shocking to you, but some of these may take years or all even go as far as, say, decades before you get to them. But at least we all know where they kind of rack and stack from, from somebody kind of taking another look at them. And understanding that some of these might take some time to get to on that, we, we're interested in, so what kind of interim measures might you be considering, knowing that it might take years, decades, to be able to get to something like that? So is there something that can be done to make sure that you're keeping that under review? You're keeping at least some kind of attention on that. You haven't forgotten it, you haven't thrown it away, but is there something else in the interim until you get to it? Interim could mean many years, many decades, okay? It's not, it, it's not all of these until your next comprehensive assessment or, or to your next PA. That, that's not the intent here, okay? I think we all have to get used to actually thinking in, 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 those, in those regards. You know, I mean, in the past, everything has been, okay, we wanna see all the recommendations and you know, we wanna know that you're gonna be able to address all of these until your next part 12 in five years. And I think that we were all just 
I don't know, playing a game <laughs> to, to, a, to a degree. I mean, I can't imagine that, that we really expected that to happen, nor you to think that you were really going to be able to get to that. I mean, there's, there's resource constraints, there's limitations on all that. So let's be realistic in what those all look like on that, right? So I hope that wasn't a secret somewhere. So let's look at annual probability failure. So, so like the, the incremental life safety risk, annual probability of failure. So provide an evaluation of those failure modes that have an annual probability of failure of greater than one times 10 to the minus five. So what does that look like? So here, here is our one times 10 to the minus four line. So within one order of magnitude of this. So any failure modes that plot at this line and above, you would have to have an evaluation. So for this one, it would be this guy, these three, these three, those two, okay? Those are two different risk measures. And we want to be able to evaluate those based on their risk measure and, and not just to kind of, hey, you know, risk is certainly the important one, but, but this is a second risk measure because it's a likelihood of something happening, okay? So we want to be able to, to address those. So the non-breach risk risk matrix, the financial damage state risk matrix, and the non-breach life safety risk matrix don't have any type of tolerable risk guidelines on them. So it, it's up to the independent consultant looking at this, the team, to be able to provide an overall evaluation of, of each one of these. So actually, here this was a non-breach. This, this non-life safety risk was if you had other consequences like economic cultural, something else that you're plotting on a risk matrix, okay? So, so these ones don't have the, uh, uh, any type of tolerable risk guideline. There's no dashed line, for example. So it's like, so, so, so within how many orders of magnitude of what line? Well, there is no line. But knowing that when you look at those risk matrices, you'll have something that plots you know, further to the, to the upper right, even though many of them might be down in the lower left-hand corner. But whichever ones are the highest risk, from that standpoint, to be able to evaluate those and come through those and decide, hey, I, I think I can stop here in the, in the sense that, you know, these ones really are, are not contributing any kind of importance to the overall dam safety process that we're looking for, okay? And I, and I think that it, will, it might take a few years in part for us to see kind of how this is going with, with the independent consultants and what they're providing and what the importance are. I think it's going to be part of it also with the licensees to get feedback to say, hey, some of these are actually really important. You know, I'd, I'd like to be able to capture some of these. So, so this is a, a bit new for both of us in, in how to proceed, okay? So again, talked about the dam safety case. It's not where the risk estimates plot is the answer, okay? It's about what we know about the risk estimate that's ultimately important. So what are those, what are the factors that drive the risk? What was causing that? Was there something of a flaw that's present? Was it an initiation? Was it something along those lines? What, what, what was the confidence in the, in the risk estimate and the uncertainty associated with that? That might be the first time you've heard that today, right? So the other thing we talked about in section 1.5.3, that talked about this, this beast called the, the dam safety risk classification. So when Nate talked this morning about the federal guidelines for dam safety risk management, that document has a table in it that looks very, very similar to this, that all four agencies said, hey, we think it's important that once you've gone through kind of the, the, the project is we ought to at least be able to kind of classify this as we're looking at different dams. The, the group came up with a, a five level system from anywhere from very high to virtually no risk on that. The only disadvantage that was that we couldn't agree to all call it the same thing. We could agree on five levels, we could agree on a lot of the terminology, but gosh darn, after five years, we could not call it the same thing. Okay, so we were the last one to the table on this one, so we called it Dam Safety Risk Classification, DSERC. There's, from the core, you'll hear DSAC. From TVA, you'll hear the star, I think, something like that. And it, for Bureau of Reclamation, it's DISPER. 
So er everyone, but <laughs> each one has a description that says almost the same thing. The characteristics are almost identical and the actions are very, very similar on that. So unfortunate, but okay, maybe someday. So, so what does that mean? So you'll note at the very bottom, and you probably can't read this, it's this, this table is based on the incremental risk that you've calculated. So it is that red box that you saw on that one risk matrix is what informs where you come on, onto this table, okay? So you either say, hey, based on the description, I've got an active failure mode, you know, that, that's, that's happening and it's judged to be uh, extremely high such that immediate actions are necessary to reduce the risks. So if you have a failure mode that, that classifies that way, you, you will be considered a, a, a DSERC one. Talks about the characteristics, critically near failure, extremely high risk. Here's, here's the kinds of actions that would be appropriate for something like that. And so for each one of these, you would come down and you would look at that and say, hey, based on what I understand of the risk, where the total incremental life safety risk is plotting and what's driving that, I can come in here and find the description that best fits. You're not gonna find anything that fits exactly. I can, can tell you, you know, going through many, many of these, you won't find something like, oh, that's a perfect example. It, it doesn't work that way. So there's judgment involved. So again, we'll see how this evolves over a period of time. So a lot of this will also get worked out. So as part for FERC of this comprehensive, you know, assessment process is after the, after the report is, is submitted to us, there's a comprehensive assessment review meeting that takes place where the licensee, independent consultant team and FERC all get together around a table over the computer, whatever it's gonna look like. And we'll talk about things like this to be able to have an exchange back and forth to see what do the independent consultant team think, you know, their, their initial uh, uh, idea was for this DSERC rating. And we'll provide our input about, yeah, we agree with that or, hey, you know, we might be a little bit different on this and here's why. Here's how, how we would look at that. So in addition, that, that review meeting will take place and we'll talk about how the, you know, the different ranking of, of failure modes has gone. If we are in at least preliminary concurrence with our, our review of the report within the first 60 days to be able to provide that kind of feedback so that all of that can be used by the licensee before they submit, before you all submit your plan and schedule that's due within 60 days. So we encourage the, the guidelines say, hey, that has to be done within 60 days of the submittal, right? We're encouraging folks to schedule that meeting, if you can, 30 to 45 days after you've submitted that report to us so that you have a couple of weeks to be able to take that information that you're gonna gain from the review meeting to help you maybe tweak, adjust your overall plan and schedule before you submit it to us. So at least you'll have that, the benefit of that discussion ahead of time, okay? This can, this can be helpful to licensees that have an inventory of dams to be able to say, hey, I've got, you know, one DSARC 2 dam and I've got three threes and I've got four fours, for example. Perk sees that, you see that. We all know kind of what more, what's more urgent as far as being able to address those dams, but more importantly, the, the failure modes that are associated in driving that, okay? So I'll just reference you to chapter four of our RITM guidelines that we published in 2016, has that table and has a lot more information about what that means in going forward, okay? So the comprehensive uh, uh, report, compre comprehensive assessment report recommendations should be informed by the level two risk analysis results. So, during the pilot studies that were done, you know, we saw a lot of um, things that weren't kind of quite congruent from the recommendations versus the, the risks. So for example, you, know, you might have some of these really high risks out here and yet the reports didn't have anything to recommend or to do about that. So it just seems strange. So we're trying to work through, you know, what does, what does that mean? So again, hence the guidance in being able to say, hey, you ought to have all these evaluated over here, there's some ranking and prioritization of, of each one of these and then urgency associated with that and going forward. And we're gonna walk through an example after we get through all of this, just to give you an idea what, what that might look like at a, at a very high level, okay? The other part of this is, is again, we understand some licensees have one dam. 
So it's, it's much easier to kind of rank and prioritize from that standpoint. So the independent consultants that are, are working on that one project, okay, ought to be able to provide some idea of what their opinion is on the urgency and priority to address those particular recommendations, right? However, licensees that have multiple dams, okay, you've got an inventory of dams, the independent consultant team can only see what's going on with that one dam. So, so they can't really help to inform you about urgency and prioritization because they don't know how that dovetails in with all of the other things that you've already maybe got going on on your program, right? So you can provide some idea of ranking and maybe from a very high level, some idea of like, hey, this is, I think this ought to be done you know, relatively soon, whatever, again, defined relatively soon, but can't get into the nitty gritty that you as a licensee will be able to understand kind of how each one of these start integrating together as you do the next compre or your first comprehensive assessment on each one of your projects to be able to build kind of an overall portfolio of your risk to be able to say, okay, here's how all of these ought to line up. I now have all my prioritizations, you know, what might be important on, on one, one of your projects and in your next failure mode on that might be actually number five on your list because you have other failure modes from other dams that you're working on, right? Only you're going to be able to see that the independent consultant team may not have access to that information unless you provide it. So recommendations that come out of this, and Nate talked a little bit about this earlier. So, so what are we really looking at the, at the level two risk analysis study? So things like focused on further studies, and, and why would we do that? Well, we'd only recommend studies. We're hoping the ICs are only recommending studies because we need to have some kind of improvement or, or uh, better understanding of the risk for those particular failure modes. We, we want to be able to reduce the uncertainty. The uncertainty is high associated with those, or the confidence is quite low, or, and, and other, more information could perhaps change that risk estimate by an order of magnitude or even more. Those would be the reasons for further studies on that, not hopefully for some academic exercise, right? I mean, we're trying to get to something here. So, for example, for risk estimates that you have high confidence in, what that says is, I don't think any more information is going to change my estimate. In fact, if you gave me more information, I'm quite confident I would come up with the exact same estimate. So why would you recommend more studies to go out to do something on that? That, that seems kind of counterproductive and, and maybe even a waste of money. So instead, you might be taking those ones and say, hey, I think it's more effective. I'm just going to proceed directly to evaluating risk reduction measures. Well, what would that mean? Well, you know, how, how could I possibly reduce the risk of that? If it's high enough priority, you know, it's, the, the risk is high enough. So, you know, how, how could I develop a, an, an alternatives plan to reduce the risk? What measures are available to me that I could look at? Alternatives evaluations, things like that. So we look at structural evaluations, right? Well, if it's a seepage issue, maybe I need to build a berm. Maybe I need to put a cutoff wall. You know, maybe there's just stockpiling of materials. You look at different risk reduction measures to say, okay, what, what's going to get me down to something that I think might be tolerable and cost effective to be able to do that? So again, I mentioned this earlier about including recommendations for interim risk reduction measures. I'll say mostly for those failure modes that look like it's going to maybe take some time to be able to get to. So just to make sure, are, is there something we ought to be doing in the interim just to keep these under review? So finally, the slide licensees responsibility. So submit the plan and schedule to address the CA report recommendations within 60 days. Okay. And then I mentioned that I, I think what would be very helpful is to have that risk review meeting ahead of time to give you the opportunity to really have a good plan at this point being able to move forward. Okay. So a couple other things from priority kind of prioritizing and again we'll we'll work through some of this in an example in just a little bit so for those failure modes where where both the annual probability of failure and the incremental life safety exceed the the uh, threshold guidelines that, that's a higher priority okay the apf or the incremental life safety risk is driven by just a single failure mode gives priority and the apf or the incremental life safety risk is driven by a failure mode manifesting during normal operations as compared with say an extreme loading condition we consider hydrologic or seismic because that that dam sees that loading condition normal loading condition 
every single day of its life on that as compared to something that may or may not actually happen. There's just a probability of it happening. The probability of that normal load is one right now. A couple of principles, both looking at L2RAs and SQRAs for both uh, FERC and, and the core. So the greater the estimated annual probability of failure and further, the further the estimated incremental life safety risk is above the tolerable risk reference line, the greater the priority to act and the higher the urgency to take those actions. So the further you plot towards the upper right-hand corner of that risk matrix, the higher priority, the higher urgency to be able to address those particular issues. Do the, rep do the reported risks support taking action to reduce risk or is further study needed? You have high confidence in your risk analysis in the risk analysis and you can directly proceed to the next step to be able to actually go out and do something or do I need to wait first, gather more information and then then look to see do I still have an issue or not before I take any further action? Do the estimated risks support the proposed recommendations and why or why not? So again, this is a congruency between given where the risks are plotting and the case that's being made and then the actions that come from that. It is all of that one congruent, organized, logical uh, process? Or, or does, does something not make sense? You know, I've got these really high risks, it's really high priority, but I don't plan to do anything for 20 years. Probably not gonna fly, right? So being able to look all, all that should be a very cohesive and straightforward. So learning check, different way of doing. So yeah, you got out of uh, Socrative, okay? But we're gonna do a little different way here, okay? Get late in the day, understand that at least it's not Friday. I'm, I'm glad for that. So, so this is gonna be again, audience participation on all of this. So after I ask this question, if it's true, I want you to stand up, okay? Where, where the box plots on the risk matrix directly determines the action that should be taken at a given dam or levy. True, stand up. False, stay seated. Man, I didn't even see a leg just move at all. Everybody's just like, okay. I didn't see any, you know, none of those, you know, kind of like, a game show, what was it? You know, it's like somebody's supposed to stand up. No, nobody budged. Okay, well, you're not done yet. I got another one for you, okay? Same thing, true or false. The recommendations in the report should be informed by the results of the risk ass assessment. True, stand up, false, sit down. Like I said yesterday, this is the only way I got a standing ovation, so I had to do it this way, okay, so. <laughs> okay, so. I'm going to talk to you a little bit, a little bit about um, how the core, how the core does their evaluation of SQRA results. So let me start by recapping what evaluation really means. So we covered that in module two this morning, um, judging the significance of the risk that comes out of the risk analysis, and it's about examining the importance of that risk and deciding how we should act to manage it. So we're kind of how do we how do we utilize the risks the results of the risk analysis? So um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about that for dams and then again for levees. So I'm going to start with dams. So the evalu evaluations of risk are based on life safety, but also economic and environmental considerations. So life safety is always our guiding light. Um, we're going to largely, primarily, predominantly make uh, decisions based on life safety, but we want to take economic and environmental. Uh, considerations into account as well. So it's done for dams. It's done by USACE because we we own and operate our dams. We got a portfolio of around 740. Um, the consensus advice to the agency's dam safety officer is done through the dam senior oversight group. So um, the agency's dam safety officer, that's a headquarters person. So they're, they sit in Washington, D.C. They're the one that signs off on everything, but they kind of rely on the dam senior oversight group, which is like 10 to 15 experts from around the country come together and review all these risk assessments that, uh, you know, us peons like me who do all the, all the risk assessments, they, they review our results and take our, our recommendations into consideration. And they decide what to do. 
transfer it up to the dam safety officer who, who signs it. So first, compare the risks posed by the dam with limits of tolerability from an individual and societal perspective. So they're taking the results of these risk analyses and they're deciding what to do. Second, evaluate the tolerability for understanding the risks, fulfilling daily responsibilities, and reducing the risks. And then with those, those, these two things in mind, agree on a path forward that's coherent with the risks posed by the project. So that's for dams. Looks a lot similar, um, looks very similar for levees as well. Um, so again, based on life safety, but we also recognize economic environmental considerations. Um, evaluation, it's done this time with both the USACE and the sponsor participating in the discussion. There are partners in this. And so we want to let them in on the, uh, on the decision and have that, let them have a say. Um, the consensus advice to the agency and the sponsor is done through, again, the Levy Senior Oversight Group. So it was DSOG before, it's LSOG this time. A little bit of overlap there, but different group of people. Again, 10, 10 to 15 experts from across the core. Um, and they consider first, they, they compare the risks posed by the levy. So the risks that come out of the risk analysis with the limits of tolerability from an individual and societal perspective. That's the, the box on the plots. Um, second, then they compare the risks posed by the levy with the overtopping frequency. And so that's an additional thing. And then third, evaluate the tolerability for understanding risks, fulfilling daily responsibilities and reducing risks. So let me just hammer this home. Um, the first one is the only one that really has to do with what we're actually plotting onto that risk matrix. Um, well, the second one does too for, for levies with this overtopping frequency thing. But the third is a sort of these more intangible um, tolerability measurements, understanding the risks, fulfilling daily responsibilities, reducing the risk, acting like a good owner. Um, those are some other things that we consider when we're deciding what we're gonna do to either manage the risk of the, of the, of the levy or dam, or say, you know what, this is good, we don't have to do anything. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about these in a couple of slides. So, uh, you know, then they agree on a path forward, coherent with the risks posed by the project, given the scope of the decision. We uh, transmit that up to uh, headquarters and to the uh, levy safety officer and they sign off. So let me just recap also, um, there's three outcomes from a risk assessment. No action, we basically look at the risks and you say, you know, this thing's in pretty good shape. We don't have to do anything. That's pretty rare. Um, we could study it more because there's a lot of uncertainty that's come out of this, uh, this PFMA and that PFMA has really highlighted that. Or third, we could take some action to reduce the risk. So no action, study it more, or um, take some action to reduce the risk. Um, let me come back to that slide. So when we, um, the peons who are doing these risk assessments and we're briefing it to levy safety or to, the, to LSOG or to DSOG, we need to communicate those results effectively. And so when we do that, it's kind of like, it's a lot like a P, like uh, presenting a PhD thesis. You're getting up in front of these groups of 10 to 15 people and you're making your case for why you think the risk is what it is. Um, lasts about anywhere from like an hour to two hours, depending on the complexity of the risk assessment. And you're bringing forth the most salient points of the risk assessment to convince them of your results. And so that's when you make the case for your risk assessment. It's not just a number on a chart. Um, so you need to communicate the risk and uncertainty to decision makers in a convincing way. So, you know, with overtopping, you're saying, you know what, I don't think it's going to fail, even though it overtops. And they're like, what? That's crazy. Well, you know, let me make the case by saying it's only going to overtop for an hour. It's got a, a good gra uh, layer of grass on it and it's a, a fat clay. So it's got a lot of erosion resistance associated with it. And then these people who these senior oversight group people who are very familiar with these issues are like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So that's just kind of a small example of what you're doing to make the case. You're convincing them of your risk assessment. And you're also doing it in complete, uh, presenting a complete picture because you basically want to be able to convince somebody who reads that report, looks at your presentation 10 years down the road, and they can still see what you're talking about. So provide the key evidence that supports the recommended path forward. Um, another way we evaluate SQRA results for levies is for National Flood Insurance Program. Communities ask us, levy sponsors ask us to do risk assessments to inform recommendations about whether or not they should be included in this National Flood Insurance Program, um, which is run by FEMA. We got to deal with FEMA. They, they like our risk assessments. Um, 
And uh, they can use those to uh, make an inclusion in that flood insurance program. So um, that currently in most, I mean, it's not even really that current anymore. It was um, all about um, based on the levy performance for the 1% event. So you had to, you had to be have a 90% uh, confidence of passing the 100 year event. That's starting to change with the risk rating 2.0. Let's not get into that mess right now. Um, so what we've done in the past, so um, what, here's essentially, this is our risk matrix, but with different colors. Um, so here we have the annual exceedance probability. One in 100 is one times 10 to the minus two. It's this line right here. So if we're plotting our risk assessment in a point anywhere above up here, we're not passing that one in 100 flood. So the recommendation is do not accredit. If we're down below here, which is one in 100, but with a 90% uh, confidence, so that's another 10% down, another order of magnitude. So anywhere down here, we are solidly good. This is the, um, the inconclusive zone, which as luck or unluck would have it is where almost all of them plot. Um, but we can't really come back with a no recommendation anymore. So we have to, um, sometimes we end up doing a deeper dive into the likelihood of loading on these levy systems. So we're throwing all of our tools at it to go get a better understanding of how likely it is that this thing could actually get loaded. So we can actually plot a point somewhere in here a little bit more specifically and understand whether or not to make that recommendation. So it's an evaluation done with both the Army Corps uh, and the sponsor participating in the discussion. Uh, consensus advice to, to USACE, to FEMA, and the sponsor is done again through LSOG. First, evaluate the system's annual exceedance probability. Second, compare that to the table on the left, agree on a path forward. So that's um, what we do for INFIP, INFIP in a nutshell, although there can be a lot of work that goes into that for sure. Okay, so I talked a little bit earlier about those four sort of intangible tolerability risk guidelines. So we have, um, I think I got a slide with a, no. So we have um, on that risk matrix, you know, we have the, the, the diagonal line, dotted line. We have the, the horizontal dotted line that are basically guidelines for the actual risk analysis that we plot on the chart. These are the four intangibles um, that we also consider. TR, TR, TRG1, do we have a good understanding of the risk? What are the hazards and how likely are they to occur? Do we, do, have, we, have we narrowed that down pretty well? Is there not a tremendous amount of uncertainty? associated with it, how will the infra infrastructure perform in the face of those hazards, and what's the consequences? Who or what is in harm's way? TRG2, um, building risk awareness. So, uh, so related to actions that build risk awareness, it involves determining that, what that, that the risks are continually recognized and communicated. Three is related to actions that fulfill daily responsibilities. It involves determining that risks are being properly monitored and managed by those responsible for managing the risk. So it, are we being a good odor? Are we, are we taking care of our levees or our dams, as it were? And TRG4, are we do, taking actions to uh, reduce the risk involving determining if there's cost-effective, socially acceptable, or environmentally acceptable ways to reduce those risks? You know, if, if there's a, a broken wall somewhere, are we fixing that? Um, if there's some place that maybe needs a seepage berm, are we going out there and putting that on? So risk tolerability is a function of not, again, not just like the dot on the plot or the box on the plot, but all this information that we learn out of a risk assessment, we, we talk about it all together, we think about it, and we start to make a judgment about how tolerable is this risk and what can we do to, to manage that risk. So it's a judgment of the appropriateness of efforts to manage the risk at a given point in time. It's an aggregate of how well the four TRGs are addressed that we just went over in the last slide. Has the federal interest been managed through the right actions? And it's not just about a number or a plotting position on the risk matrix. So tolerable risks um, are, are those that are viewed um, by society. So can society live with them because the benefits outweigh the risks? Society does not view it as insignificant 
Society is sure they're being managed appropriately and owners continue to evaluate and reduce those risks. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples to kind of walk you through this a little bit. Um, so these are levies that we're talking about here. Um, for this particular levy, the risk drivers are overtopping with breach and large population um, at risk in a highly developed urban environment. So this is our incipient overtopping right here. Um, but this is breach. This is overtopping with breach. So it plots a little bit lower. So we call that LSAC 2, Levy Safety Action Classification 2. Um, as you can see, the risks are kind of plotting a little bit high. So here's what um, our thoughts are on those four risk tolerability measures. So TRG1, is there a good understanding of the risk? Probability of failure prior to overtopping is more than one order of magnitude below the annual frequency of overtopping, which is another measure of tolerability for us, specifically for levies. Um, the feasibility study indicated there's no cost-effective ways to reduce those risks. TRG2, sponsor works consistently with communities to promote public awareness, public engagement activities, media stories, websites, social media, mailings, and conducts surveys to gauge how well informed um, the, 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 the downstream public is. TRG3, there's an active O&M program. Uh, they've updated, tested the emergency action program. Uh, flood evacuation route, sheltering, uh, it, it's, it's in GIS so they can make some logical decisions. And they've written things down. So it's not just somebody, some, somebody an EMA guy, emergency management uh, agency person, just kind of on the phone saying, yeah, we know who to call. Yeah, no problem. If there's an emergency, you know, I got it handled. Those things should be written down. So, you know, as things age and different people come into the emergency management agencies, those things pass hands. It's written down. It's updated regularly. Uh, TRG4, continual commitment to reduce the risks. So there's three new pump stations. There's an interceptor tunnel that's been recently constructed, six outfall improvements, flood wall splash pads have been put in, seepage barriers been placed in a couple of areas, and re they've replaced three gates. So they're active, they're engaged, they're doing stuff. So despite the fact that this risk is above this tolerable risk guideline, it is more than one order of magnitude below incipient overtopping. So that would be a box that would plot here would still be one order of magnitude below that incipient overtopping. So, and with all these other things considered with that, the risk is considered tolerable. Another example, another levy, risks are plotting a little bit lower, but notice where, um, so short duration of loading in highly developed and managed systems and flow limiting capacity of upstream channels drive the risk. Um, I don't know exactly what this, this uh, this risk driving failure mode is, but I would guess that it's also overtopping with breach. But you can see it's pretty close to incipient overtopping. So we don't have that one order of magnitude separation there. So, but the risks are low. They're down below our tolerable risk reference lines, our tolerable risk guidelines. Um, and so here's some information on those other tolerability factors. So TRG1, um, Understanding the risk. Total incremental risk is not tolerable because it's less than one quarter, one order of magnitude below the annual frequency of overtopping. TRG2, the district has programmatic communication and sponsor engagement strategy. Uh, they've engaged the emergency management agency through silver jackets, but the community that lives downstream remains generally unaware of the risks associated with the levy system. So there's, there's, there's some things that can be done to educate these folks that live downstream of this levy. Um, TRG3, two engaged sponsors with the active own in programs with regular inspections and repairs as needed. But this is a three segment system. And one of those segments is poorly, and one segment is poorly maintained by a third sponsor. Uh, and they have, just tip my hand. Um, but uh, there's no site specific EAP. Hasn't been, nothing's written down, probably hasn't been, uh, when they say site specific, it's for their specific levy system. Uh, for uh, actual flood risk. And TRG4, proactive with repairing concrete revetment, um, monitoring during flood events, responsive to O&M, recommended levy specific EAP, and post seismic levy inspection plan. So ultimately, because this is not with more than an order of magnitude different in things like, um, you know, there's uh, poor communication to the general public, 
and no EAP, and this one sponsor is kind of poorly maintaining things, this is actually not tolerable. There's things that we can do here. We should be acting on this levy. Um, just some general guidance here on recommendations. So focus on risk drivers and should be recommendations on which we expect to act. So let's avoid, you know, um, nice to have recommendations. If, if we have a failure mode that's plotting super low, um, the risk doesn't really suggest that we should make that recommendation. Formulated to target the four tolerable, uh, the four, uh, tolerable, four risk tolerability guidelines or, you know, tolerabilities. Um, place in order of urgency or priority when we write those things down in a report. So we have an idea of how we should tackle those. And the memo will reference, um, the DSAC memo or LSAC memo that goes to headquarters will reference recommendations as well as in the report. And we wanna identify the responsible party too. Is it gonna be us? Is it gonna be the sponsor? Is it gonna be a, you know, a combination of both? Okay, a couple of learning checks here. So I'm gonna do the same thing again here. So you think, if you think this is true, stand up. If it's false, stay seated. For the USACE, the three potential outcomes for the path forward coming out of a risk assessment are one, no action, two, additional study, and three, take action. All right, we have some, some indecision over here, but uh, yeah, that's right. It's true. Very good. All right, um, one more. If you think this is true, stand up. If you think it's false, stay seated. Um, risks are tolerable if they outweigh the benefits and society generally believes they could be managed better. Okay, yeah, that's, that one's false. I don't, sometimes it's indecision is like just kind of leaving you sitting in the already sitting position, but in that case, it's all good. So, um, okay, questions about any of that? That was a lot. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I'm just curious about the comparison to the non-breach overtopping as a reference point. Um, it just seems like there's a lot of baked-in assumptions there, maybe. And what if the risk of the non-breach overtopping is already very low? Are you kind of like handicapping yourself in some sense of having to make the other risk low? Yeah, I mean, um, I struggle a little bit myself with you know something that plots this low. Is that really, you know, something that we should really consider as not to be tolerable? But, you know, I think what we're looking for is resilient levy systems. Um, so having something that's the breach prior to overtopping be separated by at least one reward of magnitude is a good rule of thumb, particularly when you're dealing with something that's as high as this. So um, another reason why we kind of came up with that is for things that plot like this, plot above tolerable risk guidelines, these tolerable risk guidelines were largely made for dams. And so... Often levees are um, governed by their overtopping. And so dams have overtopping um, frequencies more on the order of like one in 50,000 all the way to one in 10 million. So really low down here. It's not the case for levees where typically we're somewhere between one in 100 and one in 300. And so those things are just gonna plot higher. That's just, they're, they're more expensive to build. They're, more, they're, a part, they're built in, in, in partnership with communities and communities can't afford that kind of cost share. So we had to develop some additional ways to think about tolerability. 